Hey, welcome back to the Adult Bible Study of the First Baptist Church of Ray City. I'm Charles, one of our associate pastors, and today we're going to be diving back in to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, looking at one of the most famous poems and probably the most famous section of this book where Solomon is talking through and pouring his heart out in poetic form of how everything under the sun has a time and a place and a season for it to happen. I hope you enjoy today's Bible study. Ecclesiastes 3, 1. There is an occasion for everything and a time for every activity under the sun. What does Solomon mean by the word occasion here? For there is an occasion for everything. What does that, what does that word mean? And the word is an Aramaic word referring not as much to chronological time as to the appropriateness or the appointedness of a specific time, which is why there is an occasion for everything. There's an appropriate time for everything, or there's an appointed time for everything, just as the clouds come through during certain seasons and there is dryness in other seasons. And then he continues, in a time for every activity under the sun. This word activity is always used in reference to people and points to the activities that are willful acts and desired by the person. And so what we have here is we have the activities that are appointed that aren't necessarily within the control of people. And then we have the activities which are within the control of people, the willful acts and desires of people. This is the thesis statement for what comes next between verses 2 through 8, which is a poem that refers to this concept, that there is an occasion for everything and a time for every activity under the sun. Solomon wanted his readers to see that everything that happens in human life has been intentionally woven into the fabric of human experience by God, which leads us directly into the poem. And as we start into this poem, it's important to note it is a list of 14 opposites. Therefore, the poem is using poetic devices to point us to the total and complete human experience. Total in the fact that it is using the opposites, and complete in the fact that 14 is a derivative of the number 7, which is the number for completeness. These poetic devices point us to exactly what's within these refrains. This is not to say it's an exhaustive list of everything that happens within human life, but it points to the full spectrum of the human experience. And that is why it starts with the polar opposites of being born to give birth and death, a time to die. Because there is a time to give birth and a time to die. The Hebrew word here, to give birth, actually refers more to being born. And so it refers more to the individual that is being born than the woman who is giving birth to the baby, which helps us to truly see these contrasts as what they are. The moment of birth when new life is created and the moment of death when that life ceases to exist. And it points us to the ultimate thing that is being represented here, and that is that every human life has an appointed beginning of birth and an appointed end in death. A time to plant and a time to uproot. In the semi-arid land of Israel, the seasonal rains were vitally important for both planting and harvesting. It was crucial to know when those things occurred, and so it's important to see how these timings of things, the uprooting and the planting, relate to one another. And we should see a pattern here along with verse 3, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, 
that Solomon is creating a pattern within these first two verses of establishing and destroying, giving birth, dying, planting, uprooting, killing, healing, tearing down, building. These are a pattern. And from here, Solomon then turns to the natural emotions associated with this pattern. Weeping, laughing, mourning, dancing. These are the inward emotions of weeping and laughing and the outward emotions of mourning and dancing or the response to those inward emotions. And then from here, he turns to a section that's a little bit more difficult for us to understand, mainly because it's not something that we do today. A time to throw stones and a time to gather stones. What in the world did this set of opposites mean? Well, they definitely seem unusual to us. However, in ancient times, these terms had a varying array of meanings. They could have been military actions and throwing stones and gathering the stones to throw. It could have been judicial punishment. Some scholars take the rabbinic tradition that this, is a, this has sexual undertones referring to the engaging and abstaining from sexual relationships. And they see that in connection with the second half of the verse that talks about a time to embrace and a time to avoid embracing. What becomes clear is the connection with verse 6. All these refer to man's interest in engaging in things, whether it is the searching out of things and the time to account something is lost, the time to keep an item versus the time to throw it away. All of those have reference to things. But if we take verse 5 to mean the sexual undertones, it could also refer to the people and the affections for people as what verse 5 has to do and verse 6 has to do with the things. Either way, the point is the connection and the interest and engagement with the things that we have and the people that are around us. And then verse 7 a time to tear and a time to sew most likely refers to the tearing of clothes in mourning and then the sewing or stitching back together or the producing of other clothes and the sewing together of new clothing after mourning. There's also a time to be silent and a time to speak. A wise person knows when both of these are to be undertaken, when to speak and when to be silent, and then a time to love and a time to hate foundational human emotions connected with the decision-making and action, and then their corporate expressions of war and peace. Ultimately, what we see throughout this entire poem is a view towards the sovereignty of God, which reassures us of God's control and sobers us because God's control remains a mystery that we cannot unravel. And it is this, this reality, behind the thesis statement that there is an occasion for everything and a time for every activity under the sun that causes Solomon, the teacher, to complement the nature of work in verse 9. What does the worker gain from his struggle? The word gain here points to what is left over or the profit of an activity. This is also a restatement of Ecclesiastes 1 3, the very beginning of the entire of the entire book, which says, What does a person gain for all his efforts that he labors under the sun? For all of his activities, for everything that he does, what does he gain? What profit is it? And that's, like I said, restated here in verse 9. And what we see is that in light of that verse, Ecclesiastes 1 3, and in light of the poem that we've just gone through we can surmise that Solomon's question is more of who's in control of my life. Is God in control or am I? To this, he gives an answer in verse 10. I have seen the task that God has given the children of Adam to keep them occupied. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also put eternity in their hearts. No one can discover the work of God has done from the beginning to the end. Verse 10 ultimately ends up being a transition statement, which Solomon 
reminds us of the extensive investigation he has undertaken, which he told us in verse 13 of chapter 1, and how he applied his mind to examine and explore through wisdom all that is done under heaven, that God has given people this miserable task to keep them occupied. Verse 13 is being reminded us in the fact that he has seen the task that God has given the children of Adam, people, to keep them occupied here on earth. And then he comes up with three points. And the first point is here. Number one, he has made everything for its appropriate time. It is God who is in control and everything has its appropriate and proper time. Most translations take this word appropriate to mean beautiful, which captures its clean and delightful aspect of God's ordering of time. The second point is here. He has also put eternity in their hearts. God has placed in man a capacity for eternal things. But what does it mean for us to have a capacity for eternal things? It means that we ponder and think of things more than the immediate succession of time. Things that are transcendent and we desire to know and have a purpose greater than the mere gathering and acquisition of possessions. We want what we do in life to have a meaning and a purpose. We want to leave a legacy to live beyond the life in the here and now. Because unlike the rest of God's creation, we are created in His image and after His likeness. Although we are mortal, we yearn for the immortality. We yearn for eternity because God has placed it in our heart, making us image bearers. But the third point, no one can discover the work God has done from beginning to end. We might be created in God's image, but we are not God and therefore do not have the capacity to know as God does the beginning from the end. We might yearn for immortality as image bearers, but we must glorify God through the redemption he has offered us in Jesus Christ, knowing that only he can know the beginning from the end. Only he is God Almighty, and only He is truly in control. This is the conclusion Solomon comes to in the following verses. I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and enjoy the good life. What does Solomon mean by this statement? Since we cannot know God's plan, as we just read here, since no one can discover the work God has done from the beginning, since we cannot know God's plan, we must trust our benevolent Creator, rejoicing in what He has given us and enjoying the life He has given us as it prepares us for eternity. Because it is God who gives the gifts and trials. It is the gift of God whenever anyone eats, drinks, and enjoys all his labor. Because God is ultimately the giver of all things. And Solomon continues in verse 14, I know that everything God does will last forever. There is no adding to it or taking from it. What does Solomon mean by this first statement? I know that everything God does will last forever. That although human activities are consigned to life under the sun or under heaven, God's activities are eternal and unchanging. There is no ending to it. There is no no taking from it. God works so that people will be in awe of Him. He is unchanging forever. And when we are in awe of God as He desires for us to be, we find our satisfaction in God and the plan He has made for us. God is then glorified through our awestruck joy through the humble contentment of knowing that our loving Father in heaven is in control and our satisfaction of being within His loving embrace and trusting Him, believing that He is going to make all things right as He seeks justice for the hurting and the brokenhearted, the persecuted, 
and the needy, knowing that he will bring all things to the destination he has designed for it. For whatever is has already been, and whatever will be already is. God is in full control. His power is completely unfathomable. And he will bring justice for the persecuted, because it is the plan that he has made since creation. And we are to be awestruck by him, because that's what he desires. Because he works so that people will be in awe of him so that we will find our satisfaction in him and our contentment in him, trusting him. And that's what I want to encourage you with today. Trust God because he has orchestrated and designed all of creation to work in such a way that we might ultimately trust him through the darkness, through the brokenness, through the hurt and the pain that comes because of sin knowing that it is He who has offered redemption in Jesus Christ, that we may glorify Him who knows the beginning from the end, because He is the Almighty God who is in control of all creation.